Thank you for coming. Welcome to uh, the first of uh, Heather Davis's lecture, first of two. My name is Amy Dinas. I am the Dean of the Academy. Um, and I just want to express our enthusiasm for Heather's presence already here at the Academy. She's been an amazing addition to the new faculty and become a friend. And um, I just appreciate what you've already done in terms of your investment. So uh, we have a new academic coordinator that most of you met on Academy Day, Ivana Barisic. She is um, critical studies as part of her, um, in, in collaboration with me, her program that she's helping author. And so she is going to have the pleasure of um, introducing Heather tonight. So please join me in welcoming um, Ivana to the stand. Thank you, Amy. Uh, I'm excited that Heather is here with us. She has been a great colleague in such a short period of time here at Cranbrook. I strongly encourage all of you to introduce yourself and engage her in your work. If you have not already, sign up for the discussion groups as well. If you'd like her to visit your department for crits, please schedule this with her. She's also available on Fridays to meet with individual interested students. Heather Davis is a writer and researcher based in Montreal. Her current book project, Plastic, the Afterlife of Oil, examines the intimate manifestation of our cultural fixation with and dependency upon oil through the materiality of plastic. Heather has held postdoctoral fellowships and visiting appointments at Duke University, Penn State, UCLA, NYU, and the California Institute for the Arts. She is the editor of the Art in the Anthropocene, encounters among aesthetics, politics, environments, and epistemologies, and desire change, contemporary feminist art in Canada. She has written widely for art and academic publications, including Third Text, Camera Obscura, Philosophia, Take on India, Camera Austria, and numerous book chapters and exhibition catalogs. She's also the co-curator of Plastic Entanglements, Aesthetics, <coughs> Materials, Politics, which will be on view at Penn State in January of 2018, and then will travel to the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art, Smith College Museum of Art, and the Chazen Museum of Art. While at Cranbrook, Heather will focus on the uncomfortable inheritances of living in the Anthropocene, examining the ways in which how we think about the world literally produces the geologic and biologic conditions in which we find ourselves. In particular, she will explore the legacies of plastic and white supremacy in producing what has to be known, what has to come to be known as the Anthropocene. Please welcome me in joining Heather Davis. Oh, thanks so much, um, Ivana and Amy. Um, it's really been such a pleasure to be here. Everybody's been so incredibly welcoming and kind. Um, and uh, and I've just been having a great time since I've been here. And I've been really enjoying um, meeting all the students who I've had the pleasure of interacting with um, and learning the process of, of, of crit in a kind of formal setting. Um, and uh, so yeah, so if I haven't actually gotten to interact with you one-on-one -on -one yet, I hope that that happens um, soon. Um, and yeah, I'm just very pleased to be here. Um, I wanted to say a couple of sort of um, sort of tangential things before I sort of get going. One is um, just to acknowledge that we are on Anishinaabe territory and that I consider myself an uninvited guest here. Um, and that's just a reminder in terms of uh, the actual ongoing history of how this country came to be formed. Um, and then sort of a couple procedural remarks. Um, so for the discussion group, so for those of you who have signed up for the discussion groups and for those of you who might have taken a look at the readings, um, if you were at all intimidated by the readings or didn't understand what they were saying, you're probably not alone. So don't worry about it. Uh, just come to the discussion groups anyway. Um, I'm more than happy uh, to work through ideas with you, that's what I'm here for. Um, and I don't expect you to have any prior knowledge of these subjects. Um, the, the readings that, that I assigned to you really are in the kind of area that I'm going to be exploring tonight. Um, but it's a very specific area of, of interest and study. So, um, so uh, just I would just encourage you all to, to come. Um, 
and, uh, and a couple sort of strategies for reading, um, just in case it's been a while, or maybe your first encounter um, with really theoretical texts, um, is that if there are words that you don't understand, um, write them down, obviously look them up if you can, but those are probably words that other people also are, are unfamiliar with, and understand that theoretical language can be really technical, um, and it usually has very specific histories, um, which again, I don't expect you to know in advance, so um, just write that stuff down and bring it to the discussion groups. Um, and then the other, um, the other thing is that um, for those of you who are planning on coming to the discussion groups, if you could come with one or two critical questions that you have about the readings, and a critical question is means a question that we c you can't just have a yes or no answer to, or you can't just find a strict answer in the text. It's not like um, you know those kinds of. Uh, uh, questions that we're all sort of subjected to um, in other forms of education. Um, but, you know, obviously the idea is to like open up discussion. So, um, so those kinds of discussions, it, questions, if you could bring them uh, to, the, to the groups. Um, anyway, so, and then the other thing is if you can't get through all of the readings, um, read them in the order that they're listed in on the intranet. And if you don't know where if you don't know where that is, they're sort of at the bottom of with the sign up section of the of the internet. Okay. Um, one other sort of procedural thing um, before I get going um, is I just sort of wanted to situate a bit of my research um, because it is it is a little bit particular. And today, even though I do do a lot of um, writing on art um, and uh, you know I've studied arts in, in various kinds of capacities and have written written widely on art, um, today I'm not going to be talking about that part of my practice at all. Um, I figured I'd give you guys a break from art uh, for the day, and and so um, what we're going to be discussing instead is sort of theoretical implications around um, the emergence of this material that we've come to know as plastic. And so the ways in which I'm approaching this comes out of a disciplinary trajectory. Um, the probably the most well-known person in this field is Donna Haraway, maybe Bruno Latour. Um, those would probably be the most well-known names um, in the field. Um, and it's a, sort of a field, it's a field called, uh, I would like to call it feminist science studies, um, although uh, some people just call it science studies, but what I do is uh, a feminist science studies. Um, and um, and basically the premise of feminist science and technology studies is to really look at what are the kinds of um, technologies that we've surrounded ourselves with and how do they, what are the kinds of, um, what, what, how are the, what are the ways in which those things have emerged? What are the ways in which, what are the kinds of scientific practices or technological understandings that have caused them to exist in the world in the first place? Um, so what are the kind of, um, philosophical premises that cause materials like plastic to exist in the first place, um, because it doesn't just emerge out of anywhere or from anyone, it emerges out of a very specific set of historical circumstances. Um, and, and, then, and then how does that then shape the world that we live in? So I'm interested basically in this kind of recursive framework between ideas and materials. So basically what kinds of ideas produce what kind of materials, and then how do those materials produce different kinds of ideas? in the world. Um, so I'm going to sort of go through that in relationship um, to plastic today. Um, and I'll talk for like about 45 minutes or so, maybe a little longer, and then we can open it up to question and answer. Um, also, I'm going to sort of go back and forth between reading and just talking. Um, so every family has a story or a series of stories that get repeated again and again over dinners, whenever a guest or a new partner arrives, sometimes to the annoyance and sometimes to the delight of those who have heard them thousands of times before. They are stories that serve to bind people together, to provide a sense of continuity and identity, that give people a sense of cohesion and belonging that in many ways create family. They project a certain image outwards of how one wants to be seen. One of these kinds of stories that my family repeats was when the prototype of the plastic milk bag was being developed, as I told you briefly in the introduction the other day. Um, my grandfather, who worked for DuPont as a chemical engineer and then later as a manager, brought home various milk bags for my grandmother to test. The first versions of these had no corresponding container, so you know the thing that you see here, it, it didn't exist at first. So my grandmother would have to keep the bags in a bowl or transfer the milk to a pitcher. She recalls how difficult they were because they would flop around and spill the milk everywhere. Oh, they were a pain, she would say. 
Eventually, a corresponding plastic pitcher made from a harder plastic and a more durable plastic was developed to go along with the milk bags to solve this particular design problem. But then there was the question of how much milk um, should be in each bag and how many bags should be grouped together. So my grandmother schlepped around various poor portions of bags, carrying them around the house with seven children hanging off of her, demanding her attention, all the while helping my grandfather determine what other housewives would buy. The story points to many things, the gendered division of labor, the ways in which domestic plastic products uh, target women, and how commodities are developed not through necessity, there already existed numerous receptacles for milk, but because of cost effectiveness. The cheapest way to package a liquid is in a bag, hence the milk bag. And of course, the burgeoning plastics industry was always looking for new markets to sell their products. I begin with this story not because I intend to speak about the design or the merits of the plastic milk bag, you're probably relieved to hear that, um, but because it illustrates the ways in which my life has intimately and always been bound to plastic. It illustrates what almost every living person on earth could now claim, how our lives and the world that we live in has been substantially shaped by this particular set of polymers that we have come to group together under the name plastic. In my case, this is perhaps more direct than in others, and probably also more beneficial than in um, many others. But everyone on Earth can now claim to be the inheritors of the legacies of plastic. What the story also indicates are the ways in which structures of privilege are passed down and inherited, how my life was shaped by the imbrication with DuPont, how my education was determined by my grandparents' education, and how my middle classness is also determined by theirs. This inheritance ties me personally to the plastic industry in ways that speak to my material well-being and simultaneously to my unease with this intergenerational affiliation. Um, as you'll quickly learn, I feel rather ambiguous about plastic in general. I open with this story to position myself personally with respect to plastic, but also to open up questions of inheritance more broadly of the inheritance of worlds that come before and after us, of the ways in which infrastructures and materials are also part of these processes of inheritance, to ask what worlds has plastic created and for whom? So inheritance itself is a fraught term. I employ it here to speak of the ways in which we become with the world and how the world is in us and of us before we even exist. Inheritance speaks to the things that we have no direct influence over, to the conditions of possibility of our lives, to the intergenerational knowledge and unfolding of matter that connects us to our ancestors and those to come. Inheritance involves the other than human world, the long lines of evolution and effort of so many forms of life from which we emerge. Inheritance speaks to the ways in which we are always entwined with the decisions of others, with their love and hope and hate and fear. I use the word inheritance because it also references how structures of privilege and power are passed on. As a term, it is primarily used to speak of property relations. Inheritance is defined in the Oxford English Dictionary as, quote, the succession to property, a title, office, etc., a coming into or taking possession of something as one's birthright, possession, ownership, right of possession, end quote. The fact that we speak of inheritance in these terms um, of right, of possession, of property is a strong indicator of the ways in which the Western modernist project conceives of intergenerational time. So instead of thinking of inheritance primarily as the things that we owe in terms of uh, to our ancestors or the, thing, the things that we owe to those to come, we think of it in terms of property, right? That's a very specific way of understanding what it means to be imbricated with intergenerational um, movements. In this telling definition, we become with the world through our objects, through the objects that both acquire wealth and sentimentality in a linear and progressive fashion. Inheritance in these terms assumes a primarily sedentary existence, one that represents an unbroken lineage, not disrupted by war or famine or slavery or colonization. I remember talking um, 
uh, with a friend of mine who was like whose family originally was from Somalia, and she always joked. She was saying like, you know, like our people, we don't ha we don't inherit belongings. Like we have no like antiques to pass down from generation to generation. Our people are nomadic. We don't do that. And so this understanding of the ways in which we think about inheritance in these terms is very culturally specific. Inheritance is also about the ways in which filial relations, patriarchy, and race are all intergenerational unfoldings that tend to shore up rather than redistribute privilege. Inheritance is also about coming into what precedes you, becoming who you are through your ancestors, as in a birthright. In this, it also has genetic overtones, how particular traits or characteristics are passed down through DNA lines. So I'm going to take up this question of um, genetic inheritance at the end of this talk in a, in a kind of strange way. Um, but for the moment, I want to um, dwell on inheritance um, in another kind of way for a second, which is that iner inheritance is never straightforward either. So despite the fact that it does all of these things, um, what uh, Jacques Derrida reminds us, inspectors of Marx, is that the being of what we are is, first of all, inheritance, whether we like it or not, or know it or not. So regardless of what we might think of the kinds of inheritances or the kinds of worlds that we're, brought, we're born into, we are that world. We cannot separate ourselves from what we are. Therefore, we cannot simply choose to accept or reject our inheritance as they are integral to our very being itself. It is possible, obviously, to continue to choose parts of our inheritance um, that are open to transformation um, and to reject other parts of our, trans of our inheritance. This is obviously part of how intergenerational time unfolds. Um, but the inheritance itself is constitutional. So with respect to plastic, and I realize this might be a funny way to talk about plastic, um, but I think it's uh, really informative, uh, which is that when we think about plastic, we do not have a choice about whether to live in a world with plastic or without plastic, for example. In fact, regardless of the decisions we make now, we don't even have a choice about the legacies of plastic or plastic pollution, as most plastic does not biodegrade. So it was the decisions of people like my grandfather that created the inheritances of people many generations into the future. So many generations of people who have not yet even been born or even thought about uh, the possibilities of being born. And regardless of what we choose to do about plastic pollution and manufacturing in the present moment, we will be stuck with the fact that plastic has already permeated our bodies and the biosphere. In this sense, the question of inheriting the world of plastic is not a choice because we can neither accept it nor reject it. Instead, it is a material that is now foundational to the world that we live in and constitutive of our very being. In other words, we cannot extract ourselves from plastic, either materially or ideologically, because it, it creates the conditions of possibility within which we make decisions to begin with. So plastic already structures the choices that we might make about it. Um, so in relationship to um, this other material that's obviously important to plastic um, uh, is um, a theorist who speaks a lot about um, petrocapitalism. And what he says I think is really important, and we can think about this in relationship to plastic, um, but obviously sort of I'm, I'm interested in the ways in which plastic is kind of an intimate manifestation of oil. Um, but what I think what he says is really important, which is that what if oil is fundamental to the societies that we have now? What if it shapes them in every possible way at every every possible level, from the nature of our built infrastructure, from the objects we have ready to hand, to our agriculture and food systems, and from the possibility of movement and travel to expectations of the capacity to move and interact. So in other words, the ways in which these technologies um, unfold in the world is that it's not just that they allow us to have particular kinds of things that we couldn't have in the past. And I think like, you know, there's a really strong argument to be made for the fact that, you know, plastic has fundamentally fundamentally shaped the 20th and 21st century. Everything that we sort of think about in terms of being modern or being contemporary or the things that differentiate us from previous generations, things like um, computers or the internet or uh, airplane travel or globalization or the access um, to goods and foods from halfway across the planet, all of those things are fundamentally dependent upon a material like plastic. If, if plastic were to suddenly vanish, um, many of those kinds of infrastructures would also vanish along with it. Um, so the ways in which, and, and you know, like if you try to think of yourself outside of the internet, it's really difficult to do, right? Like, I mean, I would have to fundamentally kind of 
um, you know, I could still be a writer, but the ways in which I would actually be a writer, the conversations that I'm involved in, the people that I know, none of those things would be the same. So this is what I mean when I say that plastic is constitutive of who we are now. We can't just simply decide that we like it or we don't like it. it that's not and for, it's not that simple for, for better and for worse. So it's that, it's that our expectations have actually changed in relationship to technology, not just that our capacity to be able to do things has changed. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, take a little bit of a step back now and actually um, sort of address some sort of maybe more basic questions, um, which is what do I mean when I say plastic? So as you know, um, plastic um, is, um, a term that can be used in many kinds of different contexts and the ways in which I use it are primarily for um, petroleum-based um, polymers. So these are kind of traditional plastics, the first of which um, was Bakelite and it was created in 1907 and patented in 1909, um, which I think is a really good thing to remind us because even though this material has now been con now constitutes the kinds of people that we are and the kinds of ways in which we can interact with the world, the n really the nature of our lives in general, um, it's, 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 it's quite a recent material. It's not, it's not an old material at all. Um, there's precursors that go back uh, before that, celluloid um, and other kinds of um, materials um, date to the mid-19th century. Um, but, but plastic that, that um, is composed um, primarily from either um, natural gas or oil, uh, that only started happening um, in 1909. Um, in terms of a, a mass product. Um, and even then it took a while for it to take off. But now obviously we have uh, a number of, of things that are actually grouped together under this term plastic. So literally plastic, when I talk about it, really is just kind of like, it's a set of molecular structures. It's not a particular quality, it's not a particular property, it's not a particular object. It really is just a set of molecular structures that is able, as we all know, to, to transform into so many different kinds of materials, things that seemingly on the surface have absolutely nothing to do with one another. I mean, what does a PVC pipe or Tyvek wrap have to do with like your tight jeans? You know, so, um, so these are the ways in which I'm thinking about what plastic is. Um, and um, so some other things like, so other things that, that I think are sort of foundational to what um, we need to know about uh, plastic um, is that obviously despite the fact that like, that we can't, we can't just get rid of it and plastic, um, you know, I'm not really gonna say this very much in the rest of the talk, so I should probably just say it now, which is that like, which is plastic obviously has all kinds of very, very good attributes, right? Like, <laughs> like you know, we like medical technologies that use plastic, that's extremely important. It's life-saving in a very literal sense. Um, you know, the ways in which plastic can be used in terms of infrastructural environments are really kind of unprecedented and the kinds of architectural projects um, that some of you may be involved in, those kinds of things are really kind of impossible without a material like plastic. Um, so it really is a fundamentally interesting material and it's also a material that opens up the, the possibilities for thinking about form in a completely different kind of way. So I think that there's all kinds of really interesting things about plastic, um, but I'm going to also focus on some of the ways in which um, plastic has, has come into existence and then created worlds that we maybe um, didn't expect or want in relationship to it. Um, and so part of what that part of what that means is really um, thinking about um, what what plastic is actually made for. So, 50% of all plastic is made for disposable applications such as packaging, and about a quarter goes into long-term infrastructure um, such as pipes. And then 40 million tons becomes textiles like nylon and polyester. So that's sort of the breakdown of of how plastic actually circulates in the world. But I think the fact that 50% of it goes into packaging is something that we really need to pay attention to. Um, and I'll come back to this at the end of the talk. Um, but what it basically means is that we've taken a material that's literally taken tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years to create and we sort of squish that time of that material into you know a, a something that you interact with for like a plastic spoon that you interact with for all of like maybe 10 15 minutes and then throw out and then it ends up back into the geologic layer or the marine ecosystem for another 100,000 years right so the ways in which we interact with the kind of relationship of time i think is like is is fundamentally skewed right like it's not um, if you think about the ways in which we might interact with patients, 
paper, it takes, what, 100 years for a tree to grow, and then, then you have a paper object for, you know, I don't know how, how long, but the, the time scales are significantly different, and then, it, you know, it'll take, like, 10 or 15 years for that paper object to biodegrade. So the time scales that we're thinking about in terms of plastic are really not the same as the other kinds of time scales that a of a lot of the other materials that we interact with on a daily basis, uh, concrete being a bit of a different example, but I'll, I'll leave that to the side. Um, but so the other, so when I, when I say that none of us can escape plastic or that plastic is constitutive of the world that we now live in, I really do mean this quite literally. Um, and The Guardian has been doing this amazing series on plastic um, that I'm just going to show you a, s a few slides from um, that show how ubiquitous plastic is now in our environment. Um, so plastic chunks on, on, on Arctic ice show how far pollution has spread. So plastic literally is everywhere on Earth. Um, it's been found recently in the Mariana Trench, which is, I believe it's 10 kilometers, maybe it's 20 kilometers, is the deepest trench in the entirety of the world, um, and they found plastic objects at the bottom of it. So, so there is nowhere that you can go on Earth that you will not find plastic. Um, also, uh, plastic is in all of our, all of our um, bodies. So plastic is... Um, Sorry, the cursor on here doesn't seem to. Anyway, um, so plastic is now found. Uh, someone just finally decided to do uh, a study on whether uh, you can find plastic in tap water um, or in um, salt, table salt, or in beer, um, or um, uh, there was another sort of common thing that that uh, that they looked at and. And it was found in basically almost every single study came up with plastic. And you can see the distribution of where it's found um, in terms of um, on the earth. So 94.4% of the tap water in uh, North America um, or in the United States um, has plastic in it. Um, and clearly, if you're drinking out of plastic bottles, then you're not immune <laughs> to this to this situation. Um, and so the question is like, so how did all that plastic get into your water in the first place, right? So primarily, there's two two mechanisms for which plastic, well, three mechanisms for which plastic enters into the water stream. One is that it um, you know it it ends up being um, blown or you know it's in it's in uh, landfills or you know it's on the side of the road or whatever, and it like gradually finds its way into a lake that then finds its way into the ocean, or it then finds its way into a lake which then finds its way into your tap water, and it just kind of breaks down. Because as you all know, like um, plastic won't biodegrade, but it does rapidly degrade, right? Like, you know, if you leave a plastic object out, it is gonna like, it is gonna break, it is gonna tear, it is gonna become rendered useless fairly quickly. A lot of our plastic objects, especially plastic packaging, does this. So, um, so it breaks down into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces, and then it ends up in the waterways. The other ways in which it ends up is just directly. So, for example, every time you wash a piece of fabric that has any kind of nylon or polyester, any of those kinds of materials in it, um, it could release up to 700,000 fibers directly into our water streams. Um, and so far, we do not have mechanisms for filtering this out. So, um, just like pharmaceuticals that get that end up in our in our water supply, um, plastics also end up in our water supply. And then, of course, once they end up in our water supply, um, they also end up um, in sea salt. Um, so, um, and they also ended up in 24 beer brands, they ended up in honey, they ended up in sugar, and in a Paris um, study in 2015, re researchers, researchers discovered microplastics falling from the air. Um, which they estimated deposits three to ten tons of fibers in the city each year, and that it was also present in the air in people's homes. So we're literally, like, we literally are composed of plastic at this moment in time. Um, so what are the kinds of consequences of this? Well, the two main... The two main concerns that people have about this, well, three main concerns that people have about this, one is that we actually have no idea really what this does. So that's, that's the first problem, is that we've done this like gigantic kind of experiment on ourselves without any kind of controls um, and without have, and having any understanding of what this might do to the world or to us. The second, the second reason why people um, are a little bit concerned about this um, is because plastics themselves um, have, even though plastic, once it's formed, most types of plastics are relatively inert in terms of a molecule. The plasticizers that are attached to plastics, so um, you know things that make your 
um, you know, the plastic like pink or heat resistant or um, bendable, any of those kinds of attributes, most of those things are actually not the plastics themselves, but rather plasticizers that are added onto um, plastic. So, you know, when you get in a car and it, it smells like new car smell, it's just plastic off-gassing. And that off-gassing is actually the plasticizers just going out, the plasticizer molecules just going out into the air. And many of those plastic uh, plasticizer molecules have been linked to all kinds of problems um, with human health. Um, and I'll get into um, BPA a bit later, which is probably the most notorious of all of these, um, of all of these plasticizers, but uh, but many of the other, but most of these other um, chemicals that are added, there's up to eighty thousand that could have been added, um, and the EPA actually has this policy of it's they will not test in advance whether the plasticizers are okay for human health or, or animal health. They test after the fact, so you have to prove that. You have to prove that the chemical is harmful rather than prove that it does no harm in order for it to be taken off um, consumer markets. Um, so, so that's that's the second sort of reason for concern in relationship to the proliferation of plastic in, in the world. The third reason for concern in relationship to the prol proliferation of plastic in the world is that when plastic is in the waterway, it attaches itself to other kinds of persistent organic pollutants. Um, so P PCBs, DDE, DDT, all of these other um, pollutants that are flame retardants, all of these other things that are already circulating in the world, because they have a similar chemical structure, um, they like to latch onto each other. They're all, they're, they're all this class of molecule called hydrophobes, um, and hydrophobes are, are, as their name would suggest, are things that, that don't like water, um, but they do kind of like oil, so they attach onto each other, and then what that means is that when you end up drinking the plastic fibers out of your, out of your um, tap, um, you could also be drinking PCBs and DDT and all kinds of other things um, that will actually leach out into your body. So, so those, are the, those are the reasons why people are concerned about this. Um, so there are some other weirder things that have happened, which I'm not going to talk about. Um, and these are the other kinds of inadvertent consequences of the proliferation of plastics in the world. Um, and the first of these is um, something called the plastosphere, and the plastosphere um, is uh, a term that was coined in 2013, and it's a new marine ecosystem. And so this new marine ecosystem um, is an artificial microbial reef. So it's a reef of microbes and bacteria and viruses that really like to hang out on bits and pieces of plastic that float in the ocean. It turns out this is a really great environment for them, and, there, and it's a particular community that doesn't exist in any other kind of ecosystem. Um, so they float around on uh, these pieces of uh, plastic, and no one's quite sure exactly what is happening yet on these pieces of plastic with this kind of combination of, of microbes, um, but that's, that's what they do. Um, and uh, and what, I, what I think it indicates are the ways in which nature and technology are always entangled together. We sometimes like to think of the fact that like, you know, we humans are doing something somehow off in a corner of, 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 the, of the earth and it's not gonna affect the other creatures, but rather, but that's just simply not the case. Um, and this is one of the ways in which um, is shown that, that that isn't the case. The other, the other thing is that um, wax worms, there's a particular um, type of wax, wax worm that is now, um, developed to be able to eat polyethylene. And when I say eat it, what I mean is that it successfully digests it. So it turns it back into its um, original component molecules so that it's no longer actually polyethylene. It's, it breaks it down into, into methane and, and other, um, other molecules. And, and, um, and what I think this is, what I think what I think this indicates is the fact that you know we think we think that these technology these basically what's happening is that plastic is is now become a driver of evolutionary change. So when we say things like plastic is going to take a hundred thousand years to break down or ten thousand years to break down or hundred years to break down, what we're actually saying is that it's going to take a hundred years or ten thousand years or hundred thousand years for an organism to evolve that can su successfully digest plastic. So that's what we actually mean when we we say these things and then and what we've done is we've inadvertently kind of pushed evolution in certain kinds of directions in order for these kinds of um, mainly bacteria to proliferate in the world um, probably quite happily um, uh, in relationship to these kinds of chemicals that are that are now sort of ever present um, so another like um, so sort of returning back to 
um, the question of, of the kinds of plasticizers that we have in the world. Um, one of them um, that I'm sure you've all heard of is BPA. Um, and just so you know, whenever you run across a bottle that says it's now BPA free, most of the other plasticizers that they then um, replace the BPA with in order to create the kinds of qualities that they wanted to have in that particular container are also phthalates. So they're also the same types of chemicals that have the same kinds of properties that BPA does. And the reason why BPA was a problem to begin with is because in studies of human health, it's been correlated with infertility, recurrent miscarriages, feminization of male fetuses, early onset puberty, obesity, diabetes, reduced brain development, cancer, and neurological disorders such as early onset senility in adults and reduced brain development in children. Um, so uh, clearly, this is a large number of, of, uh, of things that affect human health, and the way in which it goes about doing this is because phthalates have, have this um, chemical structure that mimics, um, that mimics estrogen. And so when we, think of, um, when we think of a class of chemicals called endocrine disruptors, what they do is that they have, a really, they have a very similar chemical structure, and so the body can't tell the difference between estrogen and BPA, and so it absorbs it into its system, and then it does all of these other things. And when you, when you disrupt your um, hormonal system, it has all these other effects that I just outlined. Um, and, but what I'm, what part of what I'm interested in is the ways in which then things like um, uh, BPA uh, are all then become the pro they ca they become an integral part of the process of sexing, um, and what I mean by that is in the process by which we understand the differentiation between sexes. Um, uh, and uh, by way of the kind of interference in the hormonal system. Um, so this, uh, this is the part where then um, we get into uh, what I call queer ecologies and the set of readings that I gave you for um, the discussion groups really focus on um, this particular kind of um, understanding of the world. And queer ecology is just two things. One is it's drawing from queer theory to really think about how do we think about the world in a more complicated way um, uh, drawing from the kind of resources of queer archives, drawing from understanding sex and gender in a really complicated uh, fashion, um, and also uh, really trying to think about how do we approach this kind of, s the, the world that's already contaminated in a way that doesn't revert back to a kind of purity politics, right? So it doesn't revert back to, I'm just gonna enclose myself in my house and pretend that the none, of, none of this is happening as if that were even possible at this moment. Um, and so it really, it wants to take the, the kinds of resources that are available um, through queer theory um, to really think about, think about what can be done. Um, and so one of the ways in which I enter into thinking about queer ecologies is to think about this relationship um, of BPA. So one of the things that I highlighted about what BPA does is that it can modify the sex of humans and other creatures. Right? And what I mean by that is that it literally does have um, material effects on um, the human body that, um, that, make, um, that make people less uh, gender binary. So, so that like, so for example, um, men, men's bodies start looking um, more like women's bodies. Um, and, uh, and, and one of the things that's really interesting and to me when I was doing all this research around this question is I came across this really amazing quote um, by a researcher called Max LeBaron who put it very bluntly, which, and she said, um, so the LGBTQ um, community has said that, um, that mutations in relationship to, to gender expression are something that we're okay with, but also so has the petrochemical industry. So how do we think about that kind of very odd alliance? You don't normally necessarily think of queer politics and the petrochemical industry as sharing the same values, right? Um, or I don't. Um, so I wanted to explore this kind of odd convergence of politics made from radically different interests. Um, and so that's the reason why I'm, I'm I'm sort of focusing in relationship to something that I'm calling queer ecologies. 
Um, and I also wanted to use queer theory um, and queer family formation, which often does not rely upon um, biological reproduction, to think through how we might live in an increasingly to toxic world. So if we don't assume that our kin are strictly those who we are related to biologically, and more ex expansive understanding of our interrelations or entwinements and obligations might be, might be fostered. So in other words, thinking about um, the fact that for a lot of queer folks, you can't like your family isn't necessarily the people who you are biologically related to um, because of you know the histories of historic homophobia and the ways in which the way and and I think that one of the things that's really amazing is the kind of vibrancy of family formation that has come out of queer communities and if we were to think about that in a kind of ecological mode what would that look like right so like how do we think about a kind of family formation that is not just about like who you can um, push out of your body um, but is about but is about like who you might have affinities with, who you might have political affinities with, who you might have other kinds of effective resonances with, and and in a lot of queer theory, people want to think about this beyond the human as well, right? Um, and I also want to think about the ways in which um, we could even think about something like the plastosphere or um, wax worms as the inadvertent human progeny. So as all of these chemicals that we're putting into our environment, um, one of the other statistics that I, that I haven't mentioned, um, but that is probably important to say, is that human fertility rates have been dropping quite dramatically since the 1950s, although clearly we're still doing a good job of reproducing, so that's probably nothing to worry about. But, but, uh, but, but, um, but they have been drastically dropping um, in terms of um, fertility rates. And so, and so if our fertility is, incredible, is, is, is decreasing, while at the same time we're sort of inadvertently creating these um, bacterial organisms and these bacterial communities, then can we think about those bacterial communities as our kin? Right? Can we think about those as our progeny rather than our children? Right? Um, and so those, and if, and if we take this so thought seriously, um, that we are bequeathing the world um, not necessarily to our biological children, but instead to the creation of these new types of bacteria, how would, would this shift our orientation to the future? How would this shift our orientation to how we're thinking about what the future might look like or how we might want it to be? Um, and if we shudder in horror at this thought, um, at bacteria being our progeny and our legacy, then what might we do to create worlds that we feel intimately bound to and responsible for? Um, so I'm interested in the vast archives of queer life and theory that offers many different solutions for kinship making outside of heteronormative structures or biological reproduction. Um, and in this, I also want to think about, um, Donna Haraway has this amazing um, quote, which I think really sort of lies at the heart of the kind of ethical conundrums that I'm trying to disentangle. Um, and she says, natural or not, good or not, safe or not, the critters of technoculture make a body and soul changing claim on their creators. And in this case, you know, it's these bacteria that are making a body and soul claiming uh, change on us. Um, that is rooted in the generation, uh, generational obligation of and capacity for responsive attentiveness. So in other words, how do we then create worlds with these bacteria and the proliferation of plastic as it stands now in a way that we can, um, it, in, a, in a manner that is the most ethical possible move under the circumstances that we have. Um, Another example of, of the kinds of very odd um, formations um, that uh, we find ourselves in, in terms of the confluence of progressive politics and uh, the petrochemical industry is in this um, a slogan, the future is female. So I'm just gonna tell you like a really brief story about a place close to where um, I'm from, well actually also close to here. So near Sarnia, Ontario, um, which is Canada's chem chemical valley and is sort of the very southern part of Ontario, um, and which I believe is just sort of across the river from here, although I have terrible geographical sense, so maybe somebody should look that up. Um, they have documented a severe reduction in male birth rates. So environmental justice activists 
in the Amjawang um, First Nation have worked with local doctors, scientists, and lawyers to document the first known case of a dramatic reduction in birth ratio of boys to girls that is not associated with a specific acute industrial or nuclear accident. Between 1999 and 2003, of the 100 bo children born in the community, only 35 were boys. So um, when people now say the future is female, um, they might mean that quite literally. What is particularly striking about this case um, that um, science studies scholar Michelle Murphy astutely documents is the ways in which the harms of chemicals associated with the plastics industry are not immediate, but rather operate through a temporal lag. So in other words, the harm that we see um, now, that is now starting to be seen in this community um, from exposure to chemi chemicals may take generations to unfold and may have taken generations to, to come to this point. Environmental toxicity can be passed on through the generations as they were already part of our bodies years before we were even conceived. And I mean this literally. Our grandmother's pregnant bodies, which also contained the eggs of our mothers, carried the chemicals and hormones and other environmental conditions that would already be part of our bodies many years before we were born, and the potential effects become visible in the grandchildren. So this is another way in which we might want to think about this concept of inheritance. These effects are especially produced um, through endocrine disrupting chemicals such as BPA, um, and Michelle Murphy speaks to these questions through the conceptual framework of latency. Latency draws attention to the delays of chemical toxicity, how exposure now affects who will or will not be born generations from now. Murphy writes, quote, to be latent is to be not yet, a potential not yet manifest, a past not yet felt, end quote. This type of latency makes it particularly difficult to address the negative consequences of plastic as media or plastic as environment. Latency draws attention to the delays of chemical toxicity, how exposure now affects who will or will not be born generations from now, and the relative health of those lives. In other words, what kinds of futures and future generations are we recreating through the ubiquity of plastic? To be living with and in um, plastic is not a benign reality. It involves the real foreclosures of particular kinds of people um, and the healthful capacities of our bodies. So um, to not be too depressing, um, and also because, <laughs> and also because uh, um, normally I don't actually do this at the end of my lectures, especially when I'm talking about plastic, I don't actually sort of address this question of like, what can we do? Um, but I, I figured that, th that this audience is like really specific. Like, I mean, many of you work with plastic all the time. Many of you um, are designers. Um, so, so I wanted to actually address this question of, of what, what can be done. Um, and I'm just going to do it briefly, but I think that I think that um, well, I think it'll be it'll like it'll at least give some some sort of avenues for for thinking through thinking through these these questions um, in a way that might that might sort of lead to sort of a feeling a little bit more of empowerment rather than just the kind of ethical conundrums um, and the situation that we find ourselves in that we'll explore more um, in the discussion groups. Um, but um, a couple of things obviously that can be done in relationship to plastic um, is to really think through, it involves sort of a couple of conceptual moves. So one is the concept of a life cycle and I'm sure many of you have sort of run across this concept in relationship to particular kinds of objects which is um, to really do life cycle analysis, which is to actually look at what materials, so for any given object, so say for this, this object right here, right, which is like a metal water bottle, um, where did it have to be mined from? Where did the metal have to be mined from? What chemicals were used in the process of mining? Whose bodies were used to mine that object? Then, then how did it get manufactured? What is its lifespan? And what will it, what will it, where will it end up? And when? You know, those are the questions that one has to consider in relationship to making an object. So what I'm advocating for here is not the elimination of plastics as if that were even possible at this moment of time, but for us to develop a new kind of ethical orientation to materiality, right? And part of that ethical orientation to materiality is to really think about this kind of intergenerational time or the questions of inheritance and the, the question of material unfolding over a longer duration than the, what we're used to. Um, the other things that, that sort of are 
a kind of much more sort of pragmatic than, than I normally um, am, are things, questions around things like the circular economy. So thinking of all waste as a kind of resource. So what are the kinds of ways in which um, any kind of waste product could become a resource? So instead of just, like right now, um, it, it, it's something like, 75% of plastic just goes straight to the landfill. Um, and so even though we could be recycling plastic, which, I mean, has its own uh, structures and problems with it, um, we don't, right? So, so the, I mean, that's the other, that's the other, the, the other kind of question. And some of that is actually um, a design problem. So, for example, like, if you have a difference between a green plastic bottle and a clear plastic bottle, the green plastic bottle, no recycling plant is ever going to want to take that. It's a pain to recycle you can't recycle it with the other materials, um, it's very difficult, um, etc. Also, when you mix materials, so you know, like when you get like a coffee cup from Starbucks or wherever, and it kind of looks like it's cardboard, it's just coated in plastic on the inside. And that is actually more problematic than just a PET um, container, because because you, ha you, you have a mixture of materials that are not going to get separated out, right? Nobody is going to take the time to separate out those materials and then in recycle them individually. So really thinking about the ways in which um, products are designed from the beginning with this kind of larger notion of both waste as, um, as an infinite resource and also um, that, uh, that we have to think about the entire life cycle of a product, um, I think actually can really go a long way to think about how we might reorient ourselves to the material conditions in which we find ourselves in and go some way to, am to ameliorating um, the kinds of some of the concerns that I brought up today. Um, so I'm going to stop there and we can open it up for question and answer.